Is there a value difference between genuine and manufactured pocket lint? Welcome back to Perpetual Jank Machine, the entertainment for people who are still waiting on a GPU. I'm John. I'm Miles. Miles, today I want to talk about code review because code review is important, very important for organizations, but it's also the place where a lot of personalities tend to come out in people. I've done quite a few of them and you kind of get to know people after you've reviewed them and been reviewed by them wait, wait, for a little wait. bit, at so, least in terms of how so they work So let me get this straight. I'm reviewing um, your review of code reviews. Yes, yes. It's a meta meta re review review. Okay. All right. I, I think. can get behind this. All right. So I want to go into a couple of personalities that you can run into firstly when you're being reviewed. So the person who is reviewing you. And then I want to hop into some some personalities that you may find yourself uh, borrowing for for your own code reviews and why they why they might not be the best thing in the world to do. So I guess yeah. to start us off when you're being reviewed, I've definitely put in a couple of merge requests where the reviewer just has nothing to say, but it's not really because your code was good and you know there's a lot of design compromises that were in there, but it's more just like because they're really busy and they don't really want to review your code at the moment. You're like, no rush, no rush, please. Like, don't actually rush it. Like, actually give me some feedback if you would. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've definitely gotten a lot of stuff into a code base, which like, yeah, it's not like sabotage or anything. It's it's fine code, but definitely some stuff that I would have expected to get comments on that I knew this, like, especially this person would have commented on and they just let it fly. I'm like, oh, you did not look at this. <laughs> <laughs> that's terrible. <laughs> like, oh, that's not a good sign, man. That means there's a lot of security vulnerabilities out there. <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, given our track record as, as humans of software security, I mean, does this really surprise you? Yes, but it shouldn't. I know that much. <laughs> There's been times where I've looked at code from like two months ago that I didn't, I, I haven't realized that I wrote it yet, where I'm like, oh my God, who wrote this? And then I realize it was me who wrote it. And then I'm like, oh my God, why didn't anybody catch this in code review? <laughs> I don't know if that's to shift the blame, but there's also the, like, mm, you know, that that's pretty obvious. Like, kind of looking at that. You're going to be a manager someday, and you'll send out, like, a, a, an email to your whole team. Guys, we have to do code reviews better. I've been looking through my old code, and y'all are terrible. <laughs> yeah, it's not my fault. It's everybody else's fault for not calling me on it. <laughs> so then there's also the polar opposite person. I like to call this person the out to get you type, which sounds a little bit judgmental, but I think that there's some people who are out to get you for good reasons. Like for example, you, you spoke to them about this feature and you're like, oh my God, dude, I don't know how the heck I'm gonna implement this feature. This is disgusting. And they know yeah. that this feature might not be top quality if you're the one bashing it while you're writing it, right? <laughs> I mean, who isn't bashing what they're writing? <laughs> Yeah, but like more than usual, right? Like sometimes you're like, oh, this is going to be terrible. And sometimes you're like, oh my God, don't let this code go in. <laughs> it will get me fired. Yeah, I can't believe I haven't been fired for this merge request yet. More like a, uh, no, that doesn't make sense. I was going to come <laughs> up with a pun. It, it, it flopped. Keep going. Definitely sometimes when you do that, it can kind of backfire on you because then that person may be very hypersensitive to everything in the code where you may have thought through something and it's actually a relatively clever and clean fix. And the alternative is like even worse than terrible, right? <laughs> like that was what you were trying to avoid when you were saying, oh my God, I hope I don't get fired for this merge request, right? Yeah. And and that might come up and then you need to respond like, yes, but the alternative is this. And they're like, oh. They're like crisis averted, but like, geez, buddy, still. Yeah, like I realize this is a problem, but you didn't have to invoke any eldritch horrors here oh gosh and it can also kind of lead to like personal there's also grudges. this not no not personal grudges <laughs> it's just the phenomenon where like when you're already reviewing something on code you're you're i guess more incentivized to review like smaller things too because you know somebody's going to be going back in there to fix the big things right yeah so again, this isn't like a personal thing, but it just kind of perpetuates like this is like the out to get you kind of code review where it's like every little thing gets marked because, well, there's this big blocker problem and you're going to be in there within 10 lines anyway. So let's just fix all this other stuff, right? Yeah, might as well hit it <laughs> while they were there. Which just, you know, it. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, obviously, because it is probably more efficient to do it. But, uh, no, it's just soul crushing. 
yeah, it's just, oh, like, mm, yeah, d- mm, didn't want to have to do that, but okay. <laughs> I guess the file's already open. Let's fix that. Like, pride's already hurt. Can't get any lower. All right, we'll go in. Mm-hmm. Yep, this is nothing compared to the big one, so let's just let's just go for it. So there's also the people who just take, like, ungodly long for some reason to respond to code reviews. And this is usually, like, people who just have a lot of meetings from what I've seen. So it's not, like, super their fault. But, like, come on. Those meetings are, like, worthless for about a third of them anyway. You could just pull up the code and start reading it, right? <laughs> they're, they're the one presenting something on <laughs> They hear like a ping. They're like, oh, 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 uh, yeah, I got to review something. They pull up the code and then they do a group code review. Oh, oh God. Worst nightmare. <laughs> uh, it's like whenever um, someone's on like Tinder and then you're like, oh, your friend's on Tinder and then you all like bash their matches or something like that. Yeah, that don't don't think that's a great way, especially because usually those meetings are not with just developers. It's with like product owners. Like imagine yeah. if the product owner was bashing your code. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Just I've like, usually been know. able to resolve those just by very aggressive pinging, but... He's like, yeah. I don't even know Python. Even I know that screwed up. <laughs> yeah, usually those get resolved by very aggressive pinging, but then you need to make sure that you're not pinging them too much, because if you're pinging them too much and they're in, like actually in a meeting, that can be a problem. So then you're like looking at your Outlook calendar and you're like, hmm, is this guy busy? Is he out of office today? You're like, hey, could hmm. you scan me you're like, your schedule every time we do a code review? Please, How many you. times can I ping this person without looking like I'm desperate? Just feeling like Tinder again. Yeah, it kind of is. I mean, with Tinder and with code review, you both want something out of somebody. <laughs> I hate you so much. So then there's also the person who only does the small stuff, even if there's, like, big stuff with the code that's wrong. So I usually find this when I'm hopping in on something that somebody else is reviewing, or sometimes when somebody else is hopping in on something that I'm reviewing, where I'll pick out, like, all of the the small stuff. Like, oh, this condition is proven 10 lines up in this function, so you don't need to check for it again here. Or yeah, 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 yeah. maybe we can do without this null check, or maybe we should have a null check here. Yeah. And then there's somebody who comes into the code review and they're like, oh, this entire system is uh, written wrong and it's not going to interface well with this and this and this and it's going to cause a huge performance bottleneck. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't realize that. That's good to know. Usually. Usually. Usually this only happens when you're really, really well acclimated with a portion of the code and the person who's reviewing it is not, so you can kind of jump in on that. But that's definitely one of the personalities that I think is the most dangerous to a good code review process because I think it's important to make sure that you're getting code review by diverse people because obviously different people can have different positive influences on your code, but also it's important to pick people who are familiar with the subsystems that you're working in because uh, yeah, if they're not yeah. familiar, they might only do the micro stuff and then you wind up with something that's N squared in the large or yeah. has to be refactored six months down the lane. So that's an yeah. important one. I mean, I'll, yeah, otherwise you're like... So I think those are some of the personalities that most jump out to me when you're code reviewing. Some of them are a little bit funnier than others, and some of them are a little bit, I guess, more pathological than others, but I think it's still very important to make sure that we're not all taking this too seriously or personally or anything. We're all just here to uh, improve the quality of the code, as it were. Oh, no, take it personal. Don't listen to him. They're out to get you. Well, I mean, one of the archetypes is out to get you, but... I mean, well, you know, you don't have to bring that up. But they're out to get you for good reasons. They're, like, out to get you and, and help you improve. No, they you forgot you. like the, all the... your coworkers hate you. Why are you even <laughs> there? You should quit. You should probably quit. Next up on Perpetual Junk Machine, we will be doing an episode on imposter syndrome. <laughs> we should actually do that's uh that's isn't that pretty prevalent in the industry? Oh yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I guess there's also the archetype who has imposter syndrome and is afraid to comment on things because he might not be sure if it's uh a comment but the problem is is that i don't actually know if that exists because like presumably if that person were to exist i would not know about it because oh i'm sure someone's like code. okay i think i see something wrong but just in case i'm an idiot i'm not gonna point it out well i think that actually segues perfectly into our next segment because that literally never happens with me i will happily just be wrong multiple times on a code review if i think that it could potentially be a problem that's good <laughs> that's good put yourself out there hell yeah it, it's all for the betterment of the code. There's no, there's no shame anywhere. I will it's happily be wrong so in your my. Your boss can pocket some more dollars. Hell yeah, I fully endorse that idea. Abso freaking lutely.
I might be the one who is a little bit more aggressive with my code reviews, at least in terms of making sure that I get all that is in my mind out there. I really don't hold back with regards to anything. I think that's probably for the better, just with respect to making sure that everybody's able to get as many eyes on that code, but also get as many opinions on that code as possible. Because obviously, if I don't say anything, then that dissenting opinion or that opinion with advice may never come up, right? It's a good opportunity for everybody to pitch in and make sure that we're all thinking in a somewhat similar way about how the problem should be solved. Yeah, absolutely. So coming from that perspective, I have found that there are quite a few other personalities of people who are being reviewed. And I think the first one kind of in the same vein as the person who never really responds too much on your code review because they're either really busy or they're not as familiar with the subject area. There's people who just take your advice and don't really, I mean, they fix it, right? But they just kind of fall over and they don't really ask anything more about it especially on stuff that's not just like nitpicks. Like if there's a big design change and you ask them to do something very different, they might ask you for help on how to do it, but I don't think there's really ever any pushback from uh, these these kinds of people who are being reviewed sometimes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, although that is somewhat convenient for the reviewer because they don't have to continue arguing their point, it also has the potential to cause some problems down the line when you're thinking about what kind of principles you want to have with this code base and how exactly our problems are going to be solved, right? Yeah. Because I think that in those counter arguments, there is the, a great opportunity to get greater understanding and greater team cohesion within those arguments. Or even sometimes, like, I'm assuming they got, like, something going for their original idea that you might not have considered in your review. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that could even lead to myopia on the part of the code reviewer, because they might have a good solution and they I just might not be seeing that. Absolutely. So, so definitely kind of hope that people tend to speak up on code reviews. It's just sometimes people more often than not tend to either ask for clarification on how and then fix it, or they just push something new, resolve the ticket, and then on to the next yeah. thing, right? They're already so, emotionally broken. Well, when you put it that way, it sounds so sad. <laughs> <laughs> I just like to imagine everyone's depressed in a code review. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know what kind of code reviews you're going into, Miles. Well, I've been in like um like art classes and like art reviews are brutal. Like everyone's emotionally destroyed by the end of it. You're like, I had such a good idea, and then you're like, No, I didn't. No, I didn't. I'm sorry, everyone. I'm sorry you had to look at my art. I'm sorry. Are all the art review bits posed in the form of a question like Are we sure that this is the right way to go about doing this? Oh, yeah. The most passive aggression, aggressive uh, question you can formulate. That's usually how art reviews go. Oh, boy. (laughs) It's good to know that we have colleagues in the art world who are facing the same struggles. So I see the sad clown and um, I know it symbolizes your sadness. But is that is that all? Is that all this painting symbolizes? There's no deeper meaning behind it because it's it's good. It's good the way it is. But no. No, there's no deeper meaning? Oh, oh, okay. Do you think that perhaps the teardrops on the clown are representing something that has already been represented by the clown itself, frowning? (laughs) By the clown being a a sad clown. I think it may be possible to save some code space here, some art (laughs) space here, uh, just by removing those tears, doing a little refactor there. I think that uh, we've we've already kind of proven that condition there, so I think that might be a a worthwhile thing to consider. It's a little redundant. Like, what are you going to do, throw a second sad clown in there? Yeah, okay. Getting on to the next one, there's also the opposite of this, where the person who is being reviewed has kind of put, obviously just by nature of working on it, you know, the code reviewer only has a couple of minutes to spare reviewing this code, whereas the person who has submitted the code for review could have very well spent up to a week on it, right? Yeah. So it's quite possible that the person being reviewed has put a lot more thought into the issue than you have as somebody who's just kind of coming in and looking at it. Yeah. And that can kind of lead to, I guess, those moments where I put something up there, especially about the design, where I'm like, ooh, this does not make any sense. And then they come back and they're like, well, this was the best way to do it. And here's why. And your suggestion would lead to this and this and this. And you're like, oh. They're like, I've already tried that, bud. And it does not work. (laughs) Never mind. (laughs) (laughs) I feel that. I feel that. That's definitely happened to me a lot. Uh, I'm so glad that I put out the comment. I'm glad to be wrong. Obviously, yeah. if I'm wrong, less has to be done. And, and I'm glad that we were able to discuss about that. Yeah. yeah, and we and now I know exactly why this is that way. So if I see this in the future, I will not see WCF. I will see, oh, right, I'm so sorry that that had to happen. <laughs> <laughs> A little my condolences. <laughs> or, oh, right, this was the thing that I thought was stupid, but is in fact actually very smart. Okay. Yes. It's too convincing, though. Maybe that's the problem. You were right the whole time. <laughs> 
Well, that is kind of an archetype that's coming up. There's, oh, okay. there's also people who push back a lot. There's two personalities in this, right? There's the people who push back on something. And even though you think that you are still in the, in the large, correct, in the process of that pushback, they will refactor so significantly and make the code so much better that although you didn't technically get what you wanted, the code is so much better that you might as well just let it through now. Like most of your actual problems with it have been resolved other than just that big conceptual, uh, yeah, that big conceptual change that you may have wanted. They didn't, they didn't fix the answer. They just rephrased the question into a better question. Yeah. So there might still be a little bit of, you know, a little bit of weirdness in the large, like the design might be a little bit different than you might've envisioned. For example, a piece of data might be in a different format than you thought might be the most efficient. Yeah. Or for example, uh, something might be getting rendered in a different way that you thought would be the most workable. But the reason that you didn't like that in the first place is because it made the code ugly and the code is no longer ugly thanks to those refactors. So uh, might as well let it in, right? Yeah, yeah. I think that this is the best part of the code review, at least when you don't get your way, right? Because the people who put a lot more thought into it than you, who don't actually wind up doing a lot of refactors or might be doing small stuff, your impact on that code was, yes, you did learn a lot more about that code. And yes, you did kind of make them stand up and defend why they did it that way. And that's always good. But if you're doing it in such a way that causes big refactors, right, and big improvements to the code, even though you're not getting what you set out to get with that code review comment, it actually made the code significantly better. So I think this is actually the best case for a code review. We're all winners here, except for the project manager. It's going to take an extra week, by the way. Well, I mean, you're you're borrowing or you're you're paying debts up front, right? Whereas if that code that you had commented on had made it into the master branch, You'd be coming back two months later and being like, oh my God, why did this get through? But by then you're at a different company. Very, very postmodern. I like it. <laughs> this ship is sunk mainly because of me, but like, you know, I won't be here. Captain doesn't yeah. always go down with the ship, if you know what I mean. Can you imagine like 30 years later, right? You, you have to go refactor some legacy code and you're like, oh my God, what, what jerk wrote this? And then it was you. You're like, oh yeah, it was an internet here once. Oh no. What code is lasting that long? I mean, obviously a lot of code, but like, you hope not, you know? Well, if you're working at the same company for that long and that company is like a financial institution, right? Oh, no. They're still looking for COBOL programmers. Uh, half the things still run on Windows Server XP. I don't know. And when do you think those things for XP were written? The people who wrote that are now 20 years older, right? That's depressing. So then one of the other archetypes that I've run into in keeping with like the pushback theme, uh, and this one I think is probably you might fall into sometimes you think that your solution is the best, but there may be some, some greater force that may be beyond what you were thinking about with this, uh, with this patch where the person who's being reviewed may wind up pushing back just to an extent where you're relatively confident that you're correct in what you are saying, right? And they may not be understanding the whole context of the problem, if that makes any sense. Yeah, um, And then eventually the pushback just becomes so great and it becomes such a wall to overcome. And you realize that there's really just no changing this person's mind or just the number of uh, questions that they ask and that you, you know, ask in uh, return, you know, just to make sure that you're all on the same page, just kind of devolve into this discussion of semantics and they may be important semantics, but it's just not the time nor the place to have them. Yeah. And eventually you just kind of have to fall over and accept that this code is not going to get changed, even though you f may feel that it is not in the greater interest of the project for it not to be changed. Correct. You're like, if, if I push any harder, I feel like my tires are going to be slashed in the parking lot in an hour. <laughs> Or you may just not be able to get that across efficiently in whatever medium you are using. I mean, obviously, yeah, yeah, yeah. when when this is being recorded, it's not like we can all pull up a chair and discuss this shoulder to shoulder like we could in the past. Yeah. So this does tend to occur a little bit more when your communication methods are limited. Yeah. But uh, eventually the feature has to go in or the branch is going to fall too far behind and it's going to take another inordinate amount of time to get it back on top of master or main. Yeah. And then your product owner is going to be really mad. So you're just like, I hope you're right, bud. But if um, your code's bugging out in two months, don't say it didn't warn you. It's even worse when it's like smaller stuff. There's just kind of some It's If it happens on a design thing, like I can kind of understand why somebody might be motivated to not want to redesign it. They might have internalized that there might be a better way of doing this, right? Because it, it does take a lot of effort to do that. And it yeah. might not be effort that 
they can foresee themselves being able to put in for reasons including that they might not be here for the next couple of days. They might be off, they might be in meetings, stuff like that. Sometimes yeah. stuff has to go in. But when it's just something smaller and more trivial that has to be done for the sake of the code being more correct, it's, it's just kind of unfortunate because it's usually like a small, small thing that is usually just very obviously correct or has to do with coding standards that are written down, but they don't really want to fix it that way. And it's just kind of annoying. Yeah, yeah, they're like, they're trying to come up with some weird justification. And then you're like, I, I don't even want to get into this. Yeah, or it just kind of devolves into a conversation about semantics. And I really wish that I had a and good philosophy. solution for this. Yeah, and philosophy. It always, always involves a lot of always philosophy. philosophy. There's, as soon so as like, you start talking with philosophy about matter? somebody, and then they're like, you. why does anything even matter? And you're like, damn. As soon as you leave the realm of the practical, there's no going back that I found. I wish that I knew of a way to find a path back to the practical but as soon as you you jump off that cliff i just not found a way to to climb back up yeah it's it there's it's once again it's just one of those things where you just got to be like all right we'll see if um if it causes any problems like we'll we will eventually see who's right uh and th <laughs> when that day comes i will rub it in your face i have definitely had to do quite a few refactors on the back of uh, code reviews that have gone in uh in that state unfortunately and <laughs> Uh, I just wish there was a way to get it to front load it a little bit more, but yeah, I feel like. yeah. So I think those are the big personalities that I've noticed when when code reviewing and when being code reviewed. I don't know if uh, those are universally applicable. I think they kind of all morph to the kind of person that you are. Like for example, I'm the kind of person who I I like to think that I'm the person who pushes back, but then refactors it in a way that alleviates concerns. If that makes any sense, and. Uh, I also like to think that I'm just the kind of person who is more of the out to get you code reviewer, but like in a positive kind of way. So presumably if you're somebody who is of another type of archetype, then maybe you have different views of this or you have found another archetype or something like that. But those are just the kind of ones that I like them all. I'm the discovering a couple new Pokemon. <laughs> so speaking of vulnerabilities. Well, you're right, Miles. Speaking of vulnerabilities, there has been yet another speculative, uh, not really execution in this one, more of a instruction fetching vulnerabilities that have come up. There's been a new paper out of, I believe it was Virginia, that says... Harvard Law uh, School. That would be an interesting one if they started discovering CPU vulnerabilities. <laughs> now that's a law school I can get behind. I mean, if there's somebody that I could trust to find a creative way around a rigorous set of rules implemented in a processor, I mean, computer scientists are first, but then it would definitely be lawyers. Absolutely. So I figured I'd bring this one up. You know, usually these kind of specter-derived vulnerabilities are... The first ones were obviously enormous. Those were sea changes in the way that we thought about the way that processor security is handled. But oh, wow. the derived ones are like, okay, somebody implements a mitigation, it gives you like a 0.5% loss in performance, we all move on with our lives, right? Yeah, I mean, this well, one, we're, we're lucky sorry. that no one found it first. Like, imagine, like, the things that could have happened instead of just, like, a 5% drop in performance. Oh, yeah. Like, if, if this had come out in the way that, let's just say that there was a large rash of very successful attacks on people who were using VPSs and nobody knew why, that would be really oh, scary, right? Like, insane. imagine if just enormous amounts of data and databases yeah. got leaked just via that. Yeah. That would be terrible. Like, I don't know, like a, a, a um, credit score company leaking uh, tons of financial data suddenly. <laughs> yeah, it's not like we don't live in a society with a lot of leaked data. I mean, we should all be preparing for that as an oh, inevitability. Just don't make data. Just get rid of it. Anyway, but just sorry. can you imagine the panic that would have happened like if, if like yes. a string of 50 companies just got hacked in a weekend, right? Oh, my gosh. Like all your banks. There's no more banking. Oh, my gosh. Mm-hmm. And I'm very thankful that we still live in a society that's willing to pay uh, computer science PhDs a lot more to work on the right side of the law than the wrong one, at oh, least yeah. in terms of uh, expected risk and quality of life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, absolutely. So this, this vulnerability is actually quite new. So that's why I wanted to flag that one in terms of what part of the processor it actually affects. So you may be familiar with the fact that the Spectre-derived vulnerabilities mostly affect speculative execution for instructions that have already been decoded and we know what they're going to do, right? Because it involves mostly just bringing stuff into caches, uh, TLBs, stuff like that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 
for the most part, those have been fixable relatively late on in the execution pipeline. But this one, in particular, affects a piece of the CPU known as the micro-op cache, which is actually a relatively new sort of part of the CPU. Out-of-order execution and speculation have existed for quite a while, but the micro-op cache was introduced, I believe, first, at least first in desktop with Intel Sandy Bridge architecture. And that is actually a really significant development because... If you'll remember, the Sandy Bridge architecture was actually an enormous leap in performance over the preceding the Halem architecture, and it's mostly attributed to that micro-op cache. And that's because with x86, uh, decoding instructions is a time. It is a terrible, terrible time, and it's really difficult for an x86 decoder to work in an efficient way because x86 instructions are variable length, and there's a whole bunch of different ways to interpret them, and it's yeah. a massive pain in the butt. And they're Absolutely. also very complex, a lot of them. Like, you have all sorts of different addressing modes and uh, different operations. And I bet ARM is like just that. loving this. They're like, yeah, give, give people more reasons to jump to us. Yeah, so x86 is capable of overcoming these. I mean, we've gotten to the point where we can decode about four instructions per cycle, and we've been at that for a very long time. And... Although some people kind of say that's like the limit of what x86 can do, I think that we could probably go a little bit further, right? Obviously, ARM does not have these problems because their instructions are fixed width except for thumb. And I don't think that ARM chips run thumb in pretty much any capacity except when they're embedded or something like that. I mean, I, wait, didn't Apple move to ARM? Can't imagine that they would be doing much in the way of thumb just because that would... I mean, they take up less space, sure, but it does add decoder complexity, and that just doesn't sound like something that Apple would really do. Yeah, I mean, you're kind of getting, you're kind of moving away from the idea behind what makes ARM good in the first place. Yeah, so, I mean, that's that's one of the big problems with x86. And again, it's not like decoders take up an enormous amount of space. It's just that they're very complex. We don't have to do it that way. And it's going to continuously fun. become a problem because, again, x86 instructions are variable width. And that means they can be anywhere from one byte to 15 bytes, which is ridiculous. Wait, <laughs> I didn't actually know the max length of bytes was 15. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't happen that way for the most part. Like, even AVX 512 instructions are, like, usually 8 bytes-ish. Yeah, but that's still say. a lot of bytes. Like, that's 64 bits. You're usually fetching maybe 32 per cycle or something like that. So if you have that many AVX 512 instructions, then that's only four instructions. So if you wanted to decode six instructions per cycle and you're running EVX encoded AVX instructions, you're going to need to start fetching 64 bytes a cycle, which is like, why? And that's if they're perfectly aligned. Obviously, you might be catching the end of another instruction at the beginning of one. So very difficult. So anyway, the reason that this really caught my eye is because micro-op caches tend to fix a lot of those problems, right? Because if you are running in a tight loop, right, mm -hmm. and that tight loop is maybe 20 instructions long, yeah. those 20 instructions might get broken up into, I don't know, 60 micro-ops, let's say, and you have a 120 micro-op cache, that means that every time you're executing that loop, you only have to decode it once, and then you can just keep hitting that micro-op cache. Well, it's where it's already decoded, all the micro-ops are available, and then you can do all that committing and uh, other things that you do when you're yeah. running in an out-of-order processor. I mean, a, a lot of anything that's calculated is usually just tight loops, at least behind yeah. the scenes. Yeah, yeah. And like even in control-heavy code, you may very well just be running into the same move operation a whole bunch because there might be something operating on that data a whole bunch, and it might be doing it in a very similar way or something like that. I mean, add one to RAX is not the most uncommon instruction in the world. It, it may well just be in a micro-op cache already for an unrelated reason, right? It always is. <laughs> so this is kind of why this is a little bit concerning, because this is actually very early in the execution pipeline, whereas a lot of the other ones have been on like already committed instructions that we already know what they're going to do. This attacks a very uh, unique part of the processor that has been previously responsible for an enormous amount of performance uplift and also a significant amount of, I guess, complexity reduction and that you can get away with a smaller decoder. So this, I think, is going to be very interesting in how hardware vendors actually deal with this because it is, again, much earlier. And I mean, I'm obviously no hardware engineer, but it seems like this does affect the point of the micro-op cache, right? Because the point of the micro-op cache is to make sure that you don't have to decode things over and over. And this is kind of what this is attacking. Yeah, I mean, yeah, isn't that what it's attacking? <laughs> so, the that other thing is, that, it just is. <laughs> and the other thing is that this actually has a really high rate of leakage. Like some of these other Spectre vulnerabilities are like you know bytes per hour. This is like 
you know, many, many kilobits per second, it seems. So yeah. definitely uh, kind of concerning. I mean, obviously, you don't need to leak a whole lot of data to get an RSA key out of something, but this is still concerning. Yeah, no kidding. Wait, so what are the potential fix currently? Well, I don't think there's any, this is like new research. I know, like, like what is the idea behind like a fix? Is it just like disable it at key times? So there's a couple of things, because this is still related to speculation. So presumably there's some way to shut that off in software. There's There were a whole bunch of very creative solutions for the original Spectre um, in terms yeah. of how code was written. You know, you, you had the Retpoline in Linux and Windows, I'm assuming, use similar technology to patch it. Uh, and that actually turned out to be relatively performance unintensive in most workloads. If you're running a virtual machine or a database, you're kind of screwed. But if you're running like a matrix yeah. computation yeah. or something, or you're talking to a GPU, that's not really too much of a concern. Yeah, yeah, obviously. So definitely interested to see how they're going to do this. I would certainly hope that as, as somebody who owns one of those first couple of iterations of that UOP cache, I'm really hoping that uh, A, well, A, it gets fixed on my system, and B, it doesn't murder my performance in a similar way. Because this does seem like uh, something that might affect just, you know, flying through integer code, whereas the other ones, it seems like it more affected uh, stuff related to, you know, more server operation, which my puny little processor can't do anyway. <laughs> yeah. Intel like runs into so many of these damn problems that I don't know. It kind of makes their their CPUs look kind of bad. I don't even think this is just an Intel problem. I mean, no, no, I heard it affects AMD. D as has well. a UOP cache too, and presumably right. Apple has some kind of UOP cache. I mean, if yeah. they don't, that'd be miraculous. I think because the, the fact that there's like another vulnerability, I'm just it, it doesn't instill a lot of confidence in like this type of system. Once again, like mm -hmm. it looks good for ARM and it kind of hurts the, like, you know, it, it makes the whole idea of speculative calculation seem inherently, uh, like, risky. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. like, it just, it, it, like, it doesn't feel right anymore. So I'm wondering, maybe they'll, like, try to see if they can find ways to, like, I don't know, go away from that in, like, future chips, like, find other ways to optimize processing. I don't know. Mm -hmm. This is anecdotal, but I remember hearing about IBM having some kind of product that had a big main chip, right? And then it had a tiny little auxiliary chip that verified the work of the main chip, right? <laughs> and, yeah. and they actually found that once all of the speculative execution and out-of-order junk that the main chip was doing was done, uh, you were only still getting around one IPC out of that. Obviously, it was going to be much lower if it wasn't speculative. But you could actually keep up with that on the secondary chip just with like a simple, in-order, basic, not even very superscalar chip, right? Like it just takes the committed instructions after chip A is done speculating and just executes them, right? Yeah. So it's kind of weird in the sense that Speculative execution is obviously very important for making sure that code runs quickly. Yes. Um, but there's also just the idea that there may be more creative ways around it, potentially using hardware, that I think are actually quite exciting. It may well be that we find ways to gate off certain parts of chips as trusted and untrusted, because I'm assuming, and I don't know this for a fact, but I'm assuming that there's probably some kind of movement going on in the chip designers at the moment where they're starting to gate off pieces of their code as, okay, this is trusted, this is untrusted. Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm hoping that those kinds of mitigations, because presumably back in 2008 when nobody was thinking about this, I'm again, assumption, but I'm assuming that all, all of Intel's Verilog was just like, okay, well, this data is trusted, right? Yeah. And I'm thinking there might start to be a sea change around that. And I think that as that is kind of being shown in, we did see a huge dump of Spectre vulnerabilities at the beginning, right? Like back in 2019, 2020, um, there was just a huge number of them coming out, right? And they've started to kind of slow down, at least in like the traditional sense. Yeah, yeah. So, People Part of that's creative. obviously that it was a new field that was opened up, but I'm also hoping that maybe this is starting to uh, reflect in some of the newer architectures, you know, some better security practices. Because it yeah. does seem like a lot of these vulnerabilities are still being found on Skylake, which obviously Skylake is still the architecture that's out, but it's also a really old architecture at this point. Yeah, so. uh, this probably really, <laughs> this is really probably screwing with people who do a lot of hardware, op I mean, like, you know, optimization type code. <laughs> Mm -hmm. They're like, okay, yeah, so this was faster, but now I've got to retest all of my solutions because uh, it might not be faster now that this part of the ship is temporarily shut off and all that. 
I, I mean, I, the good news is a lot of it is relatively orthogonal, especially if you're talking about like SIMD and stuff like that. Because just when you're doing vector processing, like the speculative execution doesn't matter all that much because you're yeah, usually yeah, yeah, just yeah. running in a straight line anyway. I, I mean, mean, that's the whole point of vector code being optimized is you want it to run in as straight a line as possible. Yeah. I mean, I, we all like to avoid if statements, but, uh, you know, sometimes they're absolutely necessary. Yeah. But like a lot of those optimizations come in the form of like loop unrolling, which obviously you're actually reducing the amount of speculation that's going to have to happen there, right? <laughs> I mean, by definition, yes. <laughs> yes, you are. Yeah, so hopefully it seems like, at least from the kind of work that I was doing in terms of optimizing code for hardware, I have a feeling that field is going to be, it, it's still going to be alive and well after this, but and yeah. it might even be that it's needed more because we need more human intervention to get the oh, same yeah, amount yeah. of performance out of these pieces of silicon now. No, no, no. I'm not saying that it's not going to uh, be good for the industry. I'm just saying the people are probably really annoyed who are actually working in that industry. <laughs> They're probably like, okay, well, now i got to redo a whole bunch of code. Great, great, great. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> well, that's the thing. I think that you're probably not going to need to redo all that much of that code because it is, again, focused on reducing the stuff that was vulnerable in the first place. <sighs> like you update a Windows... Pat, like Windows makes a patch or something, so it's less vulnerable to these things. And you download that update because you needed it, and then suddenly your code just run like ten percent slower on something that needs to be critically fast. Well, like, yeah, but that's that's kind of like an act of God kind of thing. So that that might spur you into action to say, okay, well now I need to find another ten percent worth of stuff to fix. But it's not like I have to undo all of the work that I did before. I think that's the real spirit killer there. Yeah, uh, yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. Let, let's say that like you're playing a video game, right? And you die and you just lost 30 minutes of progress. That sucks, right? Like I usually stop playing at that point and then I come back later, right? Oh, uh, yeah, I, I sh don't get annoyed. Don't, don't get annoyed. <laughs> but like if you, if you are doing something and then you realize that you needed to do another 10% more on top of that, that's not like usually that big of a problem, right? Yeah, true, true, true. Yeah. You're like, I'll keep playing at that point, right? I'll still keep yeah, playing yeah. to get to that it's, point. It's, uh, you fair enough, fair enough. It's not like all your code went to, yeah, okay. Yeah, true. I mean, this might be different in terms of like how, I'm sure there's some people who are doing like single cycle optimizations on very control heavy code. That's probably not very, like, I'm sure a lot of the, the manuals on that may well be um, not outdated, but, you know, you may need to make some slight changes to that to, you know, make sure that it's uh, relevant now. Especially yeah. with respect to like how flags operate and stuff like that, and what oh, you know yeah. the the latency of retrieving certain like uh, either specific registers or specific locations in cache or certain TLB operations, those might need yeah. to be changed. But when you're just doing you know straight line vector code or when you're doing uh, stuff that is very reliant on just crunching numbers, that probably won't change all too much. Oh sure. no. Um. And that's the show. Thanks to Maiden, that's M-E-Y-D-A with an umlaut N for their track, The Beauty of Maths, licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 license, which serves as our intro, outro, and interlude music. You can find more in the description of this episode. Please remember that the opinions expressed in this production may not reflect those of other participants on the show or those of any participants past, current, or future employers. They're also probably exaggerated a bit for comedy's sake. Anyway, thanks for tuning in.